today, it gives me immense pleasure <laughs> to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Tony Bernardi is currently the longest serving PhD student within the Faculty of Science and Technology. And this is a fabulous milestone. He just gave me the phrase to use, like all good things, it takes time. Um, Tony has been doing his PhD part-time for many years now. He's managed to run through several supervisors in that, that time period, um, not been his fault. Um, <laughs> to say. Um, originally supervised by Leah Moore here, who's his primary supervisor while she was at the, the university here. And Leah is now an adjunct with the, the Faculty of Science and, and Technology. And um, he, I'm now representing his current primary supervisor, Dwayne White, who um, has decided he needs some frequent family points, having been in Antarctica for a period of time. Um, but Tony has been a part-time PhD student, and that's a hard journey when you are working part-time and undertaking a PhD, particularly a PhD that involves a significant field component. And so that's a tough journey. Uh, and so it's really fabulous to have Tony at this stage in his degree. He's worked previously in agronomy and in soils and hydrology roles in the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries. Um, and he's currently a hydrologist, hydrologist with the Maloon Institute, looking at the hydrology of leaky weirs through that catchment. And a number of the students will remember um, visits to the, the Maloon Institute as part of their undergraduate program here. Um, and Tony's a hydrologist with that, that program. Um, so he's really interested in the movement of water in the, the landscape. Uh, and today he's going to be talking to us about climate interactions with ground and surface water connectivity and salt export with a focus on a particular study catchment in New South Wales. I look forward to hearing from Tony. Thank you, Fiona. Um, so... Um, the, as Fiona mentioned, I, I wanted to look at the impacts of rainfall patterns on the salt fluxes in, in upland catchments and establish what the interactions are between ground and so surface waters, particularly in upland catchments. And you might want to ask why. Um, <clears throat> because there was um, diversity in, in salt expression in, in Eastern Australia, particularly in upland catchments. Um, and, and so people thought, well, it's not the same. It's, <clears throat> excuse me, more nervous than I thought. Um, generally for salt and water movement, um, the original conception model came from WA, which was just rising water tables and that brought salt up. Um, and, and so you, you had salinity and and so, but but a lot of the, particularly the extension people in um, New South Wales and, and in upland catchments sort of didn't quite agree with that and thought they were seeing something um, different. And once again, from the Western Australian experience, once you cleared the catchment, it took, you know, decades sometimes and sometimes, um, you know, two or three decades before you started seeing the streams salinize. Um, and, and salt expression on, on the land surface. Um, but what they tended to see in the um, New South Wales is that the once the catchment was cleared and, and we got a lot of rain, then um, the catchment could, could switch the salty pretty quickly. And so it was less than, uh, than a decade and so forth. Um, so that takes the academic bit. But the real reason I wanted to do a PhD was to learn. Um, so my, as Fiona mentioned, my early part of my um, life was doing agronomy and soils. And so that focused on the top two metres, if we were lucky, of the soil. And in the previous job I had, um, I was, we were working with groundwater, but we had um, hydrogeologists and stuff. And so I was looking at this bit and they were looking down here and there was a bit in the middle that nobody really looked at and I really didn't understand that. And so when I came to this um, particular um, trial, um, I really wanted to understand everything and how to look at the data and how to analyse the data and stuff like that. So I thought, this is a great way to do it. 
get a get a degree um, and also learn from from a lot of other people as well. So because if, if you do a PhD, it's easy to talk to someone and they're willing to mentor you. If you're another researcher, you're competition. If you're a student, well, you know, you feel good because you're helping them. Oops. Um, the site characteristics. So the site is in central New South Wales. Um, it's in a line between Wellington and Parks. And if you don't know where they are, um, it's about 50 k's or so south of Dubbo. Um, it's a sort of a first order catchment. It's not very big. It's 1.9. Um, and it has a stream that runs north-south. And on the eastern side, there was some cropping in the past, but now it's perennial pasture. And on the western side, they planted trees. Um, and so on the upslope, it was the spotted gum, the Carimbia maculata. And down towards the salt, scald and stuff like that, it was the Camendulensis, which is the red gum. Um, and, and so the reason for choosing this was that a lot of the extension people said they couldn't understand how things were working in the catchment. So it was a, a win. Keep going the wrong way. Okay, so this is what the catchment looks like. The one on the left has what, what we have. We have a number of boreholes. So we have um, scattered in there. So you can see um, the trees. The, where is this thing? So the trees there, there's the stream that runs down there um, and the pasture. And we have a number of um, piezometers that were um, instilled in the fractured rock and then above the fractured rock. But we also along the stream have got some um, piezometers in, in the stream bank to see what was sort of happening there. Uh, and the one on the right gives you like a DEM, so you can sort of get a, a feel of the steepness of the catchment um, and what else. And, and so there was also soil moisture. We had manual rain gauges because we had a weather station, but you can't always rely on, on, on electronics. Um, there, there was heaps of other researchers who were doing tree water use. Um, we were monitoring the stream. So there was a lot, there was a lot happening. Um, so the site itself was a, a granite. It was sort of early Devonian. Um, it was pink and it was part of the Kiama granite group. Um, the, the soils themselves are sodic, so they have um, lots of sodium. And so the, the ESP, the um, exchangeable sodium percentage is pretty high. Generally, um, in Australia, above six is considered sodic. So that means that the soils can um, disperse when they're wet and when they're dry, they, they sit. Um, and so when I, I come originally from central New South Wales off a, an irrigation property and locally, these soils were known as Sunday soils because they were too wet to work on Saturday and too dry on Monday. And everybody took Sunday off to go to church. So, you know, you missed out. Um, it has an E horizon, which is um, below the A horizon and above the B horizon. And this is, and this is bleach and it contains pitzoles, which are little nodules. And that is a reflection that water tends to sit there and minerals um, settle out from it and form, and form these nodules. So, and then there's the, the bulk density of, of the soil. And so that's how tightly the soil is packed. Um, and it ranges, and they're relatively high. So it ranges from 1.51718 um, for, for, for the horizons. And once you hit above 1.7, it's very hard for roots to go through. It's very hard for water to go through. So not much happens. And so, and you can see that in the hydraulic conductivity, which is how fast the water can move through the soil. So in the A horizon, it's relatively fast. Um, but once you get to the E, it tends to sit there because it's overlying the higher bulk density in the B. And so you get, you know, bugger all going through. Oops. Okay. So we, we so in, in this, when I say we, um, I'm also referring to Leah. Um, so I never did geology, I'm um, colour challenged. And so one of Leah's frustrations would be, it's this colour 
and I'm looking, I don't know what I was looking for, but it certainly wasn't what Leah was pointing to. Anyway, so we found these, these rocks that um, were very fine grain. They were sort of, they looked like they had a sugary texture, a fine sugary texture. And so we decided to figure out what they were and we did a survey and we found that, that they were a, a sort of a, a very fine grained and they, formed, they looked like they formed these bands across the landscape. And when we, we, we did this survey and we found that they varied from about 10 centimetres wide, which is not very wide in some of the rocks, to about 10 metres wide. Um, and so that was now a mapping. The dots are the points that we did. And then the sort of the little lines are the compass bearings that we that we thought they they printed. So from that, you put that into some software. I like black boxes and you get this. And so what you can see is that there's a, a general um, northeast to northwest trend. And then there's a minor one in, in, in complete the opposite directions. And so, and so after some um, study, we that the fine rock is an aplite. Um, so it's from the same magma chamber as the original granite, but came through later. Um, so basically, went, by the time it came through, the granite had cooled, had fractures, um, and then so it was able to go through those fractures, and that's why we get these lines of. Um, of the aplite. Um, and also the scold, um, no. So the scold itself, which is the scold itself. I'm trying. I can't even see it. There. Okay. So that's the scold area. And you can see there's a big app and the skull comes around here, but there's a big app like dot. So all those lines are an interpreted version of all, 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 all the other lines. So, so basically we've got these lines of rock, which came later that comes from the bottom and intrudes through the granite. And so they form sort of a, an idealized rectangular pattern. Um, and so if we look at this, the, the site, so part of this was to look at um, rainfall. So what we can see is what one of the things we do is the cumulative rainfall deviation from the mean. Um, and so if you don't know what that is, um, you get a, a, a set of data, preferably over 30 years, you get the average. And then for each year, you subtract that from the average. And if it's above average, it'll be a positive number. If it's negative, it'll be a negative number. And you just keep adding them up. So, so what you can sort of see that in um, the 1880s, um, there was a continuous downtrend in, in rainfall till about um, 1948, 46. And then we had an increase and then it stayed relatively um, similar. Uh, and, and that's our monitoring period. So our monitoring period was a period of low, oh, sort of, you know, average rainfall, we, we got, a big increase, a decrease, an increase, a decrease, and a big decrease. And so the what we call average and above average is um, one standard deviation from the mean. So the blue ones are really wet years and the red um, bars are the really are the really dry years. And the other years are what's termed as average. So that's average for academics. If you talk to a farmer, um, they will say that's not average. Um, they will have a, a different version of average. Um, and so for, for that long period, the average rainfall was, was, was 654 millimetres, which isn't too bad. Um, so the thing I sort of wanted to take away from this is these are like 130 years of um, climate data, but it, it's the last line in red. And that's the surplus rainfall, which is just evaporation minus rainfall for that area. And so what you can see is there's generally more evaporation um, and that's potential. So if you've got enough water and there's surplus water available for only two months in a year and that's bugger all. So it's, it's a pretty dry um, climate. Uh, okay. 
drain flow. Um, that's that's the weir we originally have before it was blown away, but um, and it gives you um, an idea of of the country and stuff around there. Um, so it's been cleared for pastures in the um, well for cropping in the 1930s, but now it's generally just just pastures. Um, so we measured um, 19 years of um, flow, and basically the thing to get out of that is that during the wet years. So during the wet years, even though rainfall um, was generally over 900 millimetres, which is considered a lot, the number of flow days, the maximum was in 2010, which there was 133. So only a third of the year, even though there was over 900 millimetres. Um, and the average flow duration, so how long each average flowed, was really, you know, like 80 or 90 um, hours less than four days. So it's a very ephemeral stream. It's a very dry stream. Um, so we went through a number of droughts and we went through a number of wet periods. So the first was the millennium drought, which started in about, you know, depending on who you talk to, between 2000 to 2003 and went to the end of 2019. <sighs> 2009, thank you. Um, I can't even say it. Um, and, and then in the middle, you had this sort of interim dryish period. And then you had 2016, which started off with an East Coast low, which is bucketed 100 millimetres, caused lots of floods. And then we had what's now known as the tinderbox drought, um, apparently because of all the fires that happened between um, towards the end of 2019 and early 2020. Um, and so what you can see in the highlighted areas is during the wet years, the rainfall is relatively high, flows are comparatively high, and the salt loads are comparatively high. And in the other years, nothing happens, basically. So you sort of wonder where all the water goes. Um, again, the same sort of thing. One of the things that we wanted to measure was how much salt comes into the catchment and how much salt goes out of the catchment. And so to do that, um, we scoured the literature, found out whatever I could. People measured the amount of um, minerals in, in rainwater, and then we were able to measure the minerals in the stream water a, a number of times. And then we could start calculating how much total salts and total chlorides. And basically what it says is that if you look at the salt IO and the chloride IO, most of the time they're less than one, and that means that there's less salt going out than coming in. So the catchment is a net salt importer, except on really wet years in red, except for 2020. And in those years, like um, where we got 1,200, we had nearly three times the amount of salt going out that oh, we had, we did, and chloride, et cetera, except for two. 2000, which was just after the drought, even though we had 900 millimetres of rain and you compare that to 2016, they're roughly the same, but there was more salt exported and chloride exported than in that year. And so that gives us a measure of how dry um, the soil and, and the landscape was. Um, so one of the things um, I was um, mentored, uh, said that you can't use um, just salt because if, if, if there's groundwater coming out, the groundwater mineralizes um, various minerals from the rocks and stuff that it passes through. So you should use chloride. And so I thought, okay, so I did that. But then I wanted to know, are there differences between um, salt input output and chloride input output? And basically, um, so I have mediums here because the data is so varied that um, you've, it, it just does the analysis on the ranks of the mediums. So basically what it says is there's no difference between salt and chloride um, input output either overall or between them during the wet years or between them during, during the dry years. Mm. So that sort of says that there's not a lot of um, groundwater coming through. So that's one pointer. Um, 
So we took some um, stream samples. We took a lot, but there was a failure in the cool room. And so a lot of the samples grew algae and so forth, which wasn't good. Um, but we managed to have to have a few that were stored somewhere else. And so we looked at a number of rainfall events. And so what I really want to do is, so this is the rainwater, the blue one, and just look at the shape. And so you can see that the shape of the, the chemicals analysis of the water is pretty much the same. It's just more concentrated in the, um, in, in the stream flow. And so that's a log scale going down on the left. And so, but but the basic shape is is the same. So it basically says it's rainwater, but it but it's just more concentrated. And so then we wanted to know. Um, so it's an upland catchment. It has a um, a groundwater system, and it's not near an ocean. So you would expect that the water in the that, that's in there would be close to rainfall because that's the only source of water, apart from the mineralization. So we looked at um, some groundwater, compared this to some groundwater samples that were taken um, about 11 months later. And so that's that green line. Thank you. Um, and it's sort of highlighted. And what it shows is they're pretty generally the same. So it comes from rainwater. However, what you can see is that the potassium in the groundwater is really depleted. And so we don't see a lot of movement in potassium. We, we see a bit of it because it tends to be scavenged by vegetation. So we don't think there's a lot of um, groundwater coming through. So this is, this is just a summary. There's a lot more data. Um, so we, um, one of my mentors, Ian Ackworth there, so I've done a lot of work with him. So I, I get a lot of um, um, help and stuff. Um, so, this is just a, a graph of, of the fractured rock system in, in the granite um, over the 19 years. And so what you can see is that, so like, um, so during the millennium drought, we had the water levels come down, they leveled off, it rained, the water levels came off, there was some rainfall bits that did it. And then we had the, the, the tinderbox drought and we really saw a, a big fall in the water. So even though the millennium drought was nine or 10 years um, the, and the tinderbox was about a third of that, we saw a, a, a bigger fall in, in the drying of the, of the landscape in, in those three years. Um, and so the, the biggest fall was in borehole seven of 6.9 metres. And to put that into context, because so borehole seven's on the eastern side, it's on the pasture. And the lowest falls were 10 and 12, which is on the upper slope. Uh, and that's in the trees. <laughs> so, you know, the conventional theory is that trees will use groundwater and will lower it. So, but that's not what we're seeing. And, and the other thing in the bottom graph is you can see that the response of 10 and 12 is, is very low. You can see the other ones have big peaks and troughs, but 10, and 12 are really, really diminished. So not a lot is, is happening there. Um, so looking at the, the, the shallow piezometers, so that's, they're the ones that are screened above the fractured rock and, and in the water tables there. Um, and so we had um, three of them that were pretty much dry all the time. We had, um, and so, two of those, no, all three of them, I think were in the trees. But what you, you can notice is that they were generally dry even from the start. And you might have, um, right at the start, when we started, they planted the trees and the trees were only this big. So they couldn't have been extracting water down to three or four meters. You know, they were, they were pretty struggling in those days. Um, and the risk, the response of borehole three, which is in the top graph that goes right down and comes up, so it's a shallow and it has the similar response as, as the deeper, deepest aquifer. So the other thing we wanted to look at was, is it possible for these groundwater systems to 
um, produce water that can go into the stream and add to flow. So what we did was, um, so this is in the upper catchment. Um, and what you can see is the dashed line and throughout the period, um, for hole 10, um, it didn't go anywhere near the, towards the, the, the bed of the stream, so it couldn't contribute. And then on the other side in the pastures, um, borehole nine, there was a bit of a, a blip in 2010, but basically the water level was below the stream. And so if we're starting to wonder why there's no continuous or, you know, episodal base flow. So in the upper catchment, it's not contributing. Um, the mid catchment is relatively the same, but um, so I haven't put that up, but if we go down to the bottom where the salt scald is and where that big dike runs through. So then we're looking at two pesos, one in the salt skull, which is one S. Uh, yeah, so these are on either side. So that's the top one. And then borehole D is on the eastern side. So the, the western side is where the, the salt is. And these are pretty much two closest to the stream. And so what you can see is that um, borehole one has a fair bit of time where the water levels are above the stream bed and borehole four, both of them, you know, a, a, a fair bit of the time. But even though, in and so the ones further in the, the salt scald have water levels which are above that, but, you know, just you'll, you'll be seeing grass for the next five days if I put all the data I have. But so, but, but what it tends to show is that if you look at the 2000 and um, between 2010 and 2013, um, both of both sides had um, water levels that were two meters plus above the um, the stream bed, but we still only had um, episodal flows in water. So you know this basically says that the um, the groundwater is not adding to to the stream flow, and so. Um, I stuck that little table, which is a bit from there. If you look at that 2010, it sat up there, but we still only had a third of the days which were which were flowing. Um, so, yeah, so we think we think what we're seeing is not really the level of the water in the water table. We think it's a pressure response because there's been some work done by others who have um, indicated there's a barometric efficiency of these, which means that the water level rises and falls with, with barometric pressure. But even if you take that out, if you can just imagine um, you've got the groundwater, we think has a confining layer, a layer that's really thick and the water can't easily move up and down. And, um, and so if you, if you, if you stick a hole in that and there's water trying to feed in, but it can't go out far enough and it can't come up and you stick a hole in it, what the water's going to do is says, thanks, I'm relieving the pressure and come up that tube, which is what we're, we're doing. And so the level of the water there will be higher than what it really is in the, in, in the water table. So I suspect that this is what's happening. Got it? Thank you. Um, so the other thing we wanted to look at was the groundwater salinity. So this is there's a lot, but what I'd like you to get is that it doesn't change a lot for, for most of the pesos most of the time. <clears throat> so if you think about it, um, these um, are in millisiemens, so that's like, you know, between two and eight. Um, Eight millisiemens? Yeah, yeah, thanks. And so it's it's relatively salty, but it doesn't change generally a lot. And so if so when I think about it, I think the um <clears throat> the e, the electrical conductivity of rain varies between depending on where you are, between seven and maybe thirty or thirty plus. Um, this is micro siemens, so point point oh three, so 0.007 to 0.03 millisiemens um, versus um, four or five. So the so if there's fresh water going in there and fresh water and rainfall going in there, 
then we should see a, a reasonable dilution of the salt in there. So the other thing I wanted to get a handle on is, um, is, is there an exchange between the regolith um, water table and the, the fractured one? <clears throat> and so I looked at the EC over the period where in the groundwater and compared the, the two of them. And so a lot of them are pretty much the same and others are, are not. So, the, you know, it's, it's a complex system. Um, the soil itself, um, basically it's sand. So the, the, the biggest constituents ten, tends to be quartz. Um, of the clay minerals, um, kaolinite is generally the highest. There are some areas of smectite, but, you know, they tend to be sandy clays, sandy loams and sandy clay loams. And what they don't do is hold a lot of moisture. So they can't hold a lot of water. Um, and so it's, it's like, you know, this farmer on, on this property has done a, a lot of um, hand feeding in the last 20 years. Um, and, and one of the reasons is the soils are shallow and they don't hold much moisture. So for them to do well, it has to be years like 2010, 16, and, you know, 20 to 22. Um, so this is one of my more controversial ones. Um, this is the soil moisture. Um, so, sorry, I'm just going to go and do this. So what you can see is these two lines, they go up and down with, with, with rainfall. Um, there's a little bit here at a metre, but at the last one it, and, and the start of like the 1.1 metre, so what you can see is these waves going up and down. And so I'd like some feedback on this. So, and those waves are about, the peaks and troughs are about 12 months apart. So when I, I did some investigating, there was a few papers that said, so this is using feeder probes. And these people were saying, yes, because the movement is not much, but they were saying that it's a temperature effect. So the feeder probes can do that. So I'm putting that um, at, 2.7, there's really no change in moisture. If it is, it is really, really small and sort of validates the, um, the hydraulic conductivity test that we did. And all we're really seeing there is, is just a, a temperature response by, by the instrument. Um, so that was, that was on the tree side. And this is another one on the pasture side. And again, at that deeper depth, um, there's not a lot of water movement. So you know, taking that as um, you're not going to get a lot of water moving down through the soil profile and, and, and into the groundwater. Okay. So one of the things that we, we sort of wanted to test was this rising water thesis. And, and so we looked at the salinity of the soil. So there's an upper slope, a mid slope, and a lower slope. And, and what you can see is that um, it's relatively low compared to the groundwater. When you get to the lower slope, uh, and so there's the blue line and the one next to it. So that's P7 and borehole two. And the blue line, no, and borehole two um, and P7 are in the salt school. So borehole two is in the middle and P7 is on the edge. So what you can see is that it starts off relatively high and gets less and less as you go down the profile. And so that to me says that there's evaporative concentration, but as you move down the pr profile, it gets less and less. And so if we did have a rising water table and water tables that are around from, you know, two and a half thousand microsiemens to three and to five, then what we should see is um, the soil EC out here somewhere, particularly in um, P7 and borehole two, which had similar characteristics to borehole one, where the water table was, was relatively high. So, you know, we don't think there's the, the water tables are, are rising and carrying salt. <clears throat> ah, how am I going? 10 minutes. Okay. So just sort of quickly summarizing, 
Um, rainfall is is really variable. You know, we can we can go through droughts, we can go through wet periods, and and then we can go through years where the rainfall is like you know in the lowest ten percent, um, the lowest ten percent decile. So you know you're getting rainfall of less than three hundred, you know, four hundred millimeters, and so on, on those soils that is really dry. Um, during our period, the rainfall was was 694. So it was, you know, Canberra is like 625, six, six, something like that. So it's even more than than what Canberra gets, and yet they can't they can't grow year round pastures, and and you know, and and the farmer has to hand feed. Um, it's even though it's it's an upland, it has high evapotranspiration, um, which is greater than rainfall. Um, the stream is pretty dry. It only flows for certain times a year and it seems to flow when there's a reasonable rainfall event. And generally, um, it, you know, even in years where rainfall is, you know, around a thousand or more, it flows, you know, it flows a less than a third of the time. Um, and then, you know, and even in a really like 2012, 1200 millimetres, um, only less than 30% of the rainfall flowed out. Um, and then in 2020, that really showed how dry the catchment was because even though it had a similar rainfall to 2016, um, there was virtually no water and, and, and salt export. Um, yeah, it's a salt importing catchment. And so if, if that keeps up for thousands of years, you'll have a, a buildup of salt. And then if you get a, some, a run of wet years, that'll be flushed out. Um, and you know, if, if you're talking, if you're talking about hundreds of thousands or millions of years, there'll, there'll be salt stalls and, and they'll go. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the um, in Western Australia and the rising water table model, the catchment switched from salt exporting to salt importing over you know tens of years and decades and stuff. But what we've seen here, it switches from year to year. So rainfall has an enormous effect on it. Um, so yeah, like in 2020, we we found that you know even even though there was a lot of rain, there was very little runoff, um, and generally, La Nina rainfalls tend to be less extreme. In other words, they're not big like thunderstorms. They're gentle rain, and it um, it it has a chance to to sort of soak in. Um, so. The, the groundwater is relatively saline, um, but it doesn't generally change much. Some of them do, but, but generally overall, it, it doesn't change a lot. And we think it's been, it's, it's decoupled from the groundwater system in some parts because it just doesn't come high enough to intersect the, the stream. And we believe that particularly where the salt load is, we have um, the water levels during a wet period, which sits above the ground level in the in the piso, but the ground itself can be dry. So that sort of suggests that it's it's not there's not real water sitting in coming up there. Um, one of the things that we didn't do was put soil moisture sensors in there. That was that was a boo boo, but you know, learn for next time. That's for the for for the new student. Um, so. From that, we think that because it doesn't, the groundwater doesn't discharge near where we are, it, it's, um, it's not a local groundwater system. It's an intermediate system, which probably um, says that the pressure effect may be controlled by the applites, but it could be also controlled from somewhere else where the rain is coming in and pushing down onto it. And it really doesn't have a, a long way to go. And probably possibly think, um, you might have sort of remembered from that, uh, map right down the bottom of the the catchment. There's a river system, Little River, and so we think a lot of it will discharge very slowly in in Little River. But even Little River um, stops flowing during severe droughts and stuff. Um, so generally, um, the upper parts of the profile are very sodic. Um, so the the granite itself is a uh, um, has a lot of sodium in it. It's, it's a, what they term a sodic granite, granitic um, 
rock and so it will add sodium to it um, and so you know it disperses when it's wet and so you can um, um, if, you, if you have a, a dispersive like subsoil and stuff like that um, it becomes like a soup it's, it's watery so you break through that and it's watery and if you get bogged in that um, and it's really a wet period you'll never get yourself out uh, it, it'll take a long time because it's just slush. It's just like soup. Um, and so these soils are very dispersive and they're susceptible to erosion um, and particularly in areas um, that have no, um, have no groundwater adding to it. Um, so if, if, for instance, you um, the, the managers plough the paddocks and it rains, then it washes off soil and you know there's there's no ground cover, nothing to hold the soil together. Then um, and and you have water sitting there, it'll evaporate. You have salt concentrating that makes it harder for any um, salt sensitive species to get established, and and so it's, it becomes a vicious cycle. Um, not much walks flows down these soils because the subsoils are are very thick as in high bulk densities, there's not a lot of pore space in there for particularly um, plants. And, and here I'm not talking about trees, I'm talking about grasses and, and stuff like that um, to go down and, and, and get water. And, and it also stops water from, from really going down. Um, so we, we, we saw that there wasn't much water movement down there and that confirms the, um, the hydraulic conductivity test that we did um so but we saw this similar patterns in soil moisture in both the trees and the pasture um so we're not too sure what's going on there and i've got to think about a bit more about that or just put it aside in the when when i'm writing the final bit of the thesis um and the soil ec one to five are really low and the skull really really says that you know it, it, it's not um, groundwater coming up. It's just water probably just sitting there from rainfall running off and, and then just slowly evaporating. Um, I'll just, and, and so uh, I'll come to that in a minute. So what this model says, so what this thing says is this is the sort of the Western Australian um, thing where you clear, groundwater comes up, carries the salt, comes to the top, it accumulates, everything dies. Um, but that's not what's happening in, certainly in this, and I think in a lot of the dry land granitic um, catchments that we have in New South Wales. Um, so this is, um, so on your right, there's um, an electro, an EM31 survey. So it's just a machine that sends an electromagnetic signal down and bounces back. And so what it, it they use it for is to work out the salinity. So the darker the colours, the greater the salinity. And so what you can see are uh, sort of, well, you could, some people can see it, um, lines across there. And so, you know, if you look at the lines that we can see through there, they sort of match the lines that we've got in there. Um, and, and I must say it was Leah that drew those because I can't see half those colours, like the, the, the gradients or, or the different colours. So, you know, I can't take, take credit for that. So... Um, just a, a couple of pictures of the contrast on the ref was the salt scald or two picture taken from about the same, the same perspective, 2003 and 2016. So what you can see is um, bare soil. Um, there's, um, there's, there's a bit of salt you can sort of see, but you know, there's, you can see the evidence of sedicity. There's, there's little patches of grass there. They tend to be salt tolerant. Trees are really small. And 13 years later, the trees have grown. And those two trees there are the same tree. So you can look at, it looks a bit sick. But that's a really old tree. Um, so I asked a farmer and, um, um, and he said it's, it's been there for over 50 years or something. So, you know, things are, things are looking good. So, so what the, the current theory is that, and, and, and this is what a lot of the extension officers had was you, and so they built these contour banks to stop water coming down the slope. And when they planted the trees, they, they put them on like furrows type things. And so if, if there is runoff, 
It hits these furrows which run across the contour and so it doesn't go very far except try and go down and then they might go in into a little the e horizon and then sometimes they go back but basically um, by planting the trees and putting the furrows in they stop a lot of water coming down there this is a bit of a flat spot and so there's less water to sit there and evaporate and the trees are doing relatively well so they don't look really flash but they were nearly dead at the end of 2019. So, and um, so they've, do, and, and now they look, they look remarkably better. So I'm still working on a conceptual model, Fiona. Um, I think I've got it, but basically there are impermeable layers. Water comes in where it's relatively permeable, hits these impermeable layers, flows out and breaks out into the slope. And so for, for us, um, this is really little river, um, yeah, and there will be um, some dikes and stuff, but yeah, um, it's 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 a complex system. Um, oh, look, I think I've mentioned just about everything. Um, it's, but I think one of the important things is the last one. Um, there was um a lot of, there was a big push, um. Just, just a, as a quick side, somebody wrote um, an article maybe 12 months ago and said, what's happened to salinity? So in the 80s and 90s, early 2000s, you know, salinity was everywhere. And in my job, we, we had a couple of meetings when I was with DPI and it was that salinity is up there with you. You're looking at every, every time you look at a landscape, you're looking at it, the eyes, you've got to look at it in the eyes of salinity. But now we don't. And, and there was a lot. And sort of in the early 2000s, there was a lot of push to plant trees in these upper catchments to try and do it. And so in a lot of the catchments that they were looking at, the catchments were generally typically freshwater. And, and this isn't a, a salty catchment. The water that comes out of here over the, the 10, no, the 19 years that we measured it has an average of 153 microsiemens. So if you, Canberra water is generally 180 microsiemens. So it's as good as Canberra water as far as salt is concerned. Um, and so, you know, there was a lot of, lot of things about planting perennials and trees and stuff in these upper, upper catchments. So, and a lot of effort and, um, and time went into that. So really um, before, you know, if, if we start getting salinity, which we will mobilise after three really wet years, then, you know, let's hope that we don't sort of rush out and start planting trees everywhere. Just basically because some of these catchments provide really fresh water to um, dilute salt that comes out of other catchments. But also some of these, um, like this one, can be relatively productive. So they, this is a sheep wool enterprise. And one of my favourite sayings is... Um, I'd prefer to put my olive oil and vinegar on um, lettuce and tomatoes than bark. So thank you. Um, I've, I've really, um, I have a lot of people to thank for this. Um, and so it's, it's Fiona and Diane for believing in me and um, look, pushing back on having me being kicked out on numerous occasions and, and, and Leah. Um, I have an external supervisor, um, um, Dr. Mark Littleboy. Um, and then, of course, there's Leah. There's three actresses there because she could have given up long ago, but she stuck stuck with it. And if there's anybody else, well, they're, they're not here. So, yeah. Yeah, that's it. Questions? I'll, um, I'll bring you the microphone so that the people on uh, the recording can hear your question. Tony, is there much of a shrub layer underneath the, the planted trees? No. Are the they're not coming back, are they? Um, so the trees were planted um, by forestry for a different reason as part of a salinity trading scheme. And so to really get things going, they planted them really thickly. So there's, there's nothing can grow underneath them. Um, and so they were going to go and thin it out. 
um, but the funding for it ran out and they left it. But the farmer is quite happy because he uses that as a shelter belt. So twice a year at lambing and at shearing, after shearing, um, you know, he opens up that paddock and the stock can go in there if, if, if it's a really um, windy or cold, cold day. So he's, he's, he's quite happy. So you're not getting, the, so the thing, looking at those pictures, you're not getting any form of shrub regeneration at all. So there's also a second thing that comes in with that, sorry, I'm a botanist, um, is the cold air drainage is stopping also the regeneration coupled with salt would be fairly lethal for most things. Yeah, yes. So, so let's go back to your thing about the temperature. This uh, vegetation. Yes. I really want to do the pasture there. Well, there's there's not much else. There's not much else. No, there's nothing else there. This is really um, a sort of a typical fine wool growing country. And that's how he makes his money. Um, with some hand paddy. Um, during the drought, it was it was a lot. Um, you know, a few times when when I went to visit him, he wasn't sure whether he'd have to sell. Like you know, the bank manager or one of the bank people were coming over to have a chat to sort about you know the the overdraft. But you know, they're still there. They're they're pretty keen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, thanks, Tony. Uh, why do you think the tinderbox drought was so much more dramatic on the groundwater than the millennium drought? Um, I think it was um, there was there was less rain, and there was um, higher um, evaporation, so there was lower humidity, and there yeah, and higher humidity, and so um, there was just no um, water getting into the ground system. Um, and I, I really don't know why. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So if you if you draw a straight line, like an average straight line through that, you see that there's a, a slow but steady falling in the groundwater, which is a real worry. Um it's 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 um yeah, it's probably seeing climate change. So one of the things that I would really like to do, but we don't have the funding, is to keep this going for another 10 years just to see if we see this pattern repeating of, of the groundwater still still going down because I think with climate change, you know, one of the things about climate change, sorry, I'll get back to you, but is that we're supposed to have more intense rainfall, so that's more runoff and, and less chance of water anywhere going into the groundwater system. So we're going to slowly deplete our, our groundwater system and we'll probably end up like, um, you know, Saudi Arabia or something as a desert. Uh, you know, 
you've got to you've got to you've got to be harsh. I don't think you've been harsh enough, to be honest. But, uh, maybe I'm the harshest person in the room, though. So, um, do you have any idea for how much soil horizon is not there anymore? So the current surface on top, what was above that originally? Um, any clues how much we've lost? No, but we we suspect that we've probably lost about from fifty to a meter of soil. Um. So if, no, we, we, we don't know for sure. So we haven't found a non-cleared um, catchment and dug down. But basically, you know, the, the, the surface horizon is really, is only like 20 centimetres or something. And, you know, um, uh, if, if you look at the other places I've worked um, with sort of similar, the, the A horizon can be anywhere up to 50 centimetres plus, um, and most of that is gone. So, so to what extent is the farming practices they're doing currently even vaguely sustainable? Because it seems like, I mean, if you want to get that sort of soil to retain moisture, you've got to put organics into it. Yep. But then if you're running this thing to bare soil... What hope do you ever have? It's uh, you know, it seems like you're just what little bit is still there is going to be getting lost, and yeah. you get into stuff that has no value, no water retention, and then you're hand feeding a hundred percent of the yeah. time. Yeah. Um. So what they are doing, um, they are not grazing it to bare soil. So they have a policy of sacrificial paddocks that they put their stock in when things get really dry, and to maintain a certain amount of ground cover in the rest of their farm to try and build it up. <clears throat> yeah, so they have a, a perennial pasture system, which is some um, imported like Phalaris and some of the clovers and stuff. So there's there's white clover in there that grows in certain areas, but there's also some um, um, native grasses and stuff, which, so that balances out well for them because they have grazing over the winter with and spring with the phalaris and, and some of those. And then if, if there's summer rain, then they have those native grasses to, to help the, the grazing. Oh, shit. Um, all right, I think... We might need to leave it there. I'm cool. sure Tony wouldn't mind having a chat with you after if you have more questions for him. But, um, yeah, let's give him a, th a big thank you one more time. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat>